talk about covalent bonding and shapes of molecules. But before I do that, I just there's a small little bit there on transition metals and D-block elements that you're supposed to know. So like the first thing I suppose is that D-block elements go from here to here. So they essentially go from scalatium to zinc, okay? So they're D-block elements there between group two and group three. Transition metals technically start at titanium and end at copper. So these would be the transition, you know, these would be the transition metals. Now, you only have to go for your course, you only have to go as far as um, number 36, element number 36. So like you're really only going to be asked about titanium to copper as transition metals on your course okay so that's the first thing um that we need that you need to just oops sorry that's the wrong thing that's the first thing that you need to be mindful about so transition metals titanium to copper inclusive so titanium and copper are included in transition metals okay now if you need to remember three properties of transition metals the first one is that and we've actually already met this that they have a variable valency what does that mean it means that the metals can lose a varying number of electrons so we had like iron can be plus two or plus three copper can be plus one or plus two they have a variable valen valency the other thing is they form these transition metals form colored compounds okay you don't need to know really you know particular colors or anything like that but um they form colored compounds like copper um copper sulfate is blue you know different um, ones like that and the other property that you need to remember is that transition um transition metals have catalytic um or behave as catalysts so that they have they have some catalytic activity so like um you know you some some of them are used um like nickel is is used quite a lot in organic chemistry now as a catalyst so they have some catalytic um catalytic activity so that's basically oh and the last thing of course you need to know then is the definition so a transition metal is one that for is one that forms at least one ion with a partially filled d sub level okay so an ion with a partially filled d sub level so like zinc um zinc is zn plus okay partially filled D sub level. So why would zinc not be included as a transition metal? Because if you write out the valency there of that ion, okay, 3s2, 3p6, 3d10, it doesn't have a partially filled D sub level, it's full. So zinc is not included as a transition metal. So the ion, the most common ion, scanadium ion, and then if you write that up, you'll see that it's 3p6, you know, the, the electron configuration. So it isn't in 3D sub level either. So your definition of a transition metal, so that's not technically a transition metal either. That's why it starts at titanium and, and goes as far as copper, does not include zinc. So because you need an ion the metal has to form at least one ion with a partially filled d sub level okay that's your definition so really in your notes you should stop the video now and use your textbook or your revision book or something to um, just a little section on transition metals remember that they just go from titanium to copper write down three properties that you need to remember and the definition of a transition metals and that would be that would be perfect okay now next thing i'm going to look at now is covalent um bonding now again this is a little bit of revision from junior cycle um, before we move on to the new stuff but anyway we just want to make sure everyone's up to speed with it now there are on page 50 there there are examples of of covalent compounds drawn out or covalent bonding, I suppose. Now, your definition of a covalent bonding is it consists of shared um, shared electrons. So the first example there they draw out is hydrogen or H2. So if you look at hydrogen on the periodic table, of course, you will see that it has two electrons. So and, and when you continue with the dot and cross idea, so you dot one atom's electrons and cross the other um, atom's electrons. Now, how will they both have... Um, a reach stable configuration they will share the electrons so these electrons are being shared there between both atoms okay so sharing of electrons so the way you would have done it in junior cert um is you would have drawn out wouldn't you one proton for for um for hydrogen and there's the electron belonging to that one okay the other proton here in the nucleus and then okay you would have shown here and you would have shown, sorry, you would have shown the sharing of the electrons between 
the two hydrogen atoms. Now this is the first shell, n equals one. The first shell can hold two electrons. So actually the first shell is stable there um, because it has two electrons in, 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 in it. So um, it's, 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 that's a stable configuration, okay? Now, the next example that they do then is they draw oxygen. So oxygen, now oxygen is in group six, remember? So if I was to draw out oxygen, it'd be one, two, three, four, five, six. And another atom of oxygen, one, two, three, four, five, six. So these have six electrons of their own. They need a share of two, don't they? So if I was to redraw that there, okay? And then you're going to, to draw here, one, two, sorry, I'll use dots for those there. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this oxygen atom over here has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, four electrons being shared, okay, makes a double bond, okay? Four electrons being shared makes that, that double bond there. What about nitrogen? If I was to draw nitrogen, nitrogen is in group five. So nitrogen atoms will have one, two, three, four, five electrons in their outer shell. This nitrogen atom will have one, two, three, four, five. So each of these nitrogens needs a share of three, isn't it? So if I was to have eight, remember they all want to have stable configuration, octet rule, all atoms want to reach stable configuration with eight electrons in the outer shell. So what goes on here, I'll just draw these in green so you'll see them clearly. One, two, three. Now look, count them up. Okay, this um, nitrogen atom has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This nitrogen atom has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that there now, how many electrons are being shared there? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six electrons, sorry, six electrons being shared. So that is going to form a triple bond, okay, where you're sharing six electrons there, okay? Another example of doing your book is chlorine. So chlorine is in group seven. So if I draw one chlorine atom there, sorry now, draw a chlorine atom, outer shell electrons only, I'm going to draw one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and I'll overlap that with the other chlorine atom, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and now they have a share of eight if you count around each, each of them there. So that's just a single, that's just a single bond there. Water, if they ask you to draw, um, draw the, show the covalent bonding in water, Oxygen has six electrons, doesn't it? So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. You need to draw two hydrogens. So you'll draw them there like that. And I'll just use the dots then to represent the electrons belonging to hydrogen, okay? So you're only drawing outer shell electrons and dot and cross. So dot one atom's electrons and cross the other. So that's the water molecule. The other example they do then is ammonia, NH3. So nitrogen's in group five. So one, two, three, four, five electrons in the outer shell of nitrogen. And then I'm going to X hydrogen's electrons there, look, and you start to draw them like that. So I'm not drawing the rings anymore. I'm just drawing the atoms here with in dot and cross shape. So that's your um, ammonia there like that. And then methane, CH4, carbon is in group four. So one, two, three, four electrons in the outer shell of carbon. And hydrogen has one electron associated with it. So there's one electron there for hydrogen. So there's the bonding, covalent bonding in hydrogen. So you have one, two, three, four. Um, you have four bonds there making up your CH4. Four. Okay, so that's how you would draw how you would draw that. And then finally, in the question there, they asked you to show the bonding in something like um, HCHO. So carbon's the biggest atom there, so I'm going to draw that first. So one, two, three, four electrons in the outer shell of carbon. I have a hydrogen there. Look, see that hydrogen there? I'm going to draw that. Okay, I have another hydrogen up here, and then I have two electrons here left. If I draw oxygen over here. And if I X oxygens, one, two, three, four, five, six, look, oxygen needs a share of both of those because it needs two. It has a, it needs two electrons. It has six of its own. Don't overly worry about that. Just get, just to have an idea, just draw in the examples in your notes from the book and have an idea of the fact that you're sharing electrons and that's what's making covalent, bond, um, that's what's making um, covalent molecules. Now, what is a molecule, by the way? Remember, we would have learned this or revised this. Molecule is a group of atoms. That's your basic definition of a molecule. How many atoms in a molecule of 
of water? Three. How many atoms in a molecule of ammonia? Four. How many atoms in a molecule of methane? Five. Atoms, the number, or molecules, sorry, the number of atoms within that molecule. And it's the smallest part of an element or a compound that can exist on its own. How many atoms in a molecule of oxygen? Two. You know, that sort of thing. Now, Next thing I want to do there now is I just want to go over the idea of valency. Now, we met valency earlier when we were talking about transition metals having a variable valency, that they can have, you know, different charges or they can, the metals can lose different numbers of, of, of electrons. But the definition for valency that you need is the number of atoms of hydrogen, basically, that, that the atom of the element will combine with. So if you take something like oxygen, what's oxygen's valency is the way they might ask you in the question. So oxygen is in group six. Oxygen has six electrons of its own in its outer shell. So it needs two atoms of hydrogen. So therefore, I would say that oxygen's valency is two. Okay. High nitrogen is in group five. What does that mean? It means that nitrogen has eight, five electrons of its own. Once eight, so what does it need? It needs three electrons to have eight in its outer shell. So I would say that nitrogen's valency is three. It needs three atoms of hydrogen. Because each hydrogen will bring one electron with it, it needs three atoms of hydrogen to satisfy um, octet, octet's rule, okay? Carbon in group four, what does that mean? It means that carbon, oops, sorry. It means that carbon has four electrons in its outer, in its outer shell. So what would the valency of carbon be? Well, it needs, it has four of its own. So to have eight, it needs four more. So it would need four hydrogen atoms to satisfy octet's rule. So you would say that the valency of carbon is four. Don't overly worry about it. Right in the definition, the valency of an element is defined as the number of atoms of hydrogen that it needs um, that the atom of each of the, the atom of the element needs to have a stable configuration or to have eight electrons in its outermost shell. Monovalent, mono implies one. So other monovalent element just means that another element that brings one electron with it um, um, to, to, to the bonding, you know? Now, the last thing that I want to touch on in this here is sigma and pi bonding. Now, sigma bonding or a sigma bond is the very same thing as a single bond, okay? A pi bond is the other bond to make up a double bond. So, you know, for instance, if you have an oxygen molecule, we drew it earlier. You have one single bond, which would be called a sigma bond. And the other bond that makes up the double bond is called a pi bond. So for a double bond, you have one sigma and one pi bond. We drew nitrogen, a nitrogen molecule out earlier on. Okay, a nitrogen molecule is made up of two nitrogen atoms, but there's a triple bond. So what would a triple bond be composed of? A triple bond is composed of one sigma and two pi bonds, okay? One sigma and two pi bonds. Now, sigma bonds are stronger than pi bonds because sigma bonds have more overlapping. You have more overlapping in sigma bonds because sigma bonds are formed by head-on overlapping of orbitals. And we've met orbitals before in chapter four, regions of space where there's a high probability of finding an electron. And pi bonds then are formed from sideways overlapping of p. You need the word p there now, p orbitals. Now I'm going to go to the photos in a second and, and try and use a photo there to explain what's going on there. But just to recap now, what do you need to know? Sigma bonds are single bonds. Okay. If you've got a double bond, that's made up of one sigma and one pi. If you've got a triple bond, that's made up of one sigma and two pi bonds. S sigma bonds are stronger. S for sigma, S for stronger. Sigma bonds are stronger because there's more overlapping between the orbitals. The orbitals will overlap head on. Whereas pi bonds are weaker because there's sideways overlapping of p orbitals. You need p orbitals for that, okay? Now, Look what's going on here in the oxygen. They're showing you the oxygen here. Now, if you remember, oxygen has eight electrons, right? That would be 1s2, 2s2, 
2px, 2py, 2pz. And do you remember we said that the electrons go in single, singly first and then come back and fill them in pairs? So have I the right number of electrons put in there now? Two and twos, four and six and seven and eight, okay? Now, so these are full, full and full, okay? Now, 2py and 2pz are half full. So they need another electron. So what do you have here? This is my Y. Remember um, the shapes of the orbitals? Um, so that's my PY here. So that's going to overlap head on. So you have one electron here and one electron here. So this is one oxygen atom. This is another oxygen atom's orbitals. So you're going to have head on overlapping there. So you're going to form your sigma bond, which has more overlapping, therefore stronger. The Z orbitals then you see, as they move in closer, they will overlap sideways. Less overlapping will form a pi bond. Less overlapping, though, and therefore pi bonds are weaker than single bonds, okay? Try not to get overly bogged down with that. Like I said, if you could just remember, you know, what's a sig sigma bond, what's a pi bond, which is stronger, that's essentially what, they, what, they'll, what they'll kind of ask you, do you know? Now... Uh, last thing, sorry now, what am I doing? This this one here. The last thing I wanted to do there is just, you had this in, um, in junior search as well, but just to kind of compare ionic and covalent properties. So um, ionic compounds are made up of ions. So they form this crystal lattice, remember? So you would have a positively charged sodium ion, say, surrounded by loads of negatively charged chloride ions. So, whereas with covalent, they're made up of individual molecules, okay? Ionic are usually hard and so hard because, and they have high boiling points because they have the positively charged, negatively charged ions have a strong force of attraction. So those ions are held together quite strongly, meaning they'd be solid at room temperature, they'd have high boiling points, they don't want to separate, they have a strong force of attraction. And then they conduct electricity when molten means when they're melted or if the ionic compound is dissolved in water. The ions are free to move if they're melted in liquid form or if they're dissolved in water and therefore they can carry the current, they'll carry the, um, the electricity. Opposite then, covalent soft, low melting points, low boiling points, um, because they don't have these positive and negatively charged ions attracting to each other. They're usually liquids or solids um, at room temperature and they do not conduct electricity, okay? All right, thank you. Oh, one last thing, actually, that I just wanted to show you. I photo, photo, took a photograph of this out of your books as well. This shows you the idea of, um, of, oops, this shows you the idea of valency, okay? So you can see here, look, okay, if something's in group four, has four electrons in its outer shell, so that needs four atoms of hydrogen. If something is in group five, five electrons in its outer shell needs three atoms of hydrogen. If something is in group six, it has six electrons in its outer shell, needs two. If something is in group seven, it needs one. So valency is just the number of atoms of hydrogen that the atom of an, of an element will need to have a full 